worship on the second Sunday in Lent. I want to especially welcome those who may be worshiping for the first time and also those of you who are worshiping online. All are welcome, all gathered here or gathered online to join us for Holy Communion. Uh, there are additional instructions for that in the bulletins. You are invited downstairs after worship today for the second in a series of Lenten adult forums called Now is the Time, which is a study of the ELCA Declaration to People of African Descent. All are invited on Wednesdays in Lent for a soup supper starting at 5.30 and then um, hold an evening prayer at 6.30. On the second Sunday of each month, including next week Sunday, Gloria Day has a table at the drag show at Big Grove Tap Room, which starts at noon. If you would like to be a uh, representative of Gloria Day with a small group of others, you can talk to Pastor Sarah. Marissa Colander has an announcement, and there she is. Good morning, everyone. I wanted to just extend to you um, an opportunity to buy some stock in our youth. Uh, you may have noticed there are some colorful tags hanging on the windows there in the narthex and a table set up. Um, there's also a little blurb that explains this a little bit more in your bulletin. But for the month of March, we will be hosting a stock sale table in the narthex uh, and online um, that will help us build up a fund, essentially, that will help offset the cost to families of middle school and high school youth who want to participate in things like a Bible camp over the summer, or a mission trip, or next year is the National Youth Gathering. These are huge expenses to families. Um, when their children want to participate. And so Stock Sale aims at helping families offset that cost by building up a fund and then distributing dollars each year for those for uh, students to participate in those things. Um, if you buy stock in youth, you will um, receive a stock sale certificate uh, when you visit the table, um, and then you'll be invited to a stock sale supper in August um, where we will, uh, the students will share with you what they learned um, at their camp or on their mission trip or whatever the event that they did over the summer that they benefited from the stock sale dollars, they will present that to you and will enjoy a wonderful dinner together. So that's the return on your investment, so to speak. So I hope that you will consider um, donating to that fund. Uh, if you want to do that, you can grab a tag um, from the strings in the narthex or simply just come to the stock sale table and tell us how much stock you want to buy. We'll be there um, after worship today and after uh, today and every <laughs> uh, Sunday this month. So we hope to see you there. Thanks. Thank you, Marissa. Other announcements can be found in your bulletins. I invite you now as you are able to stand for the brief order of confession and forgiveness. Blessed be the Holy Trinity, one God who journeys with us these 40 days and sustains us with the gift of grace. Amen. Let's acknowledge before God and one another our need for repentance and God's mercy. Holy God, we confess to you our faults and failings. Too often we neglect and do not trust your holy word. We take for ourselves instead of giving to others. We spoil rather than steward your creation. We cause hurt, though you call us to heal. We choose fear over compassion. Forgive us, renew us, and lead us as we seek to follow in your way of life. Amen. Hear the good news. God so loved the world that God gave the only Son so that all may receive life. This promise is for you. God embraces you with divine mercy forgives you in Christ's name, and revives you in the Spirit's power. Amen. Our gathering hymn is printed in the bulletin.
grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. and guide in the waters of baptism you bring us to new birth to live as your children strengthen our faith in your promises that by your spirit we may lift up our life to all the world through your son Jesus Christ our Savior and Lord who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit one God now and forever amen you may be seated
The first reading is from Genesis, the 12th chapter, beginning with the first verse. The Lord said to Abram, Go from your country and your kindred and your father's house to the land that I will show you. I will make of you a great nation, and I will bless you and make your name great, so that you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you, and the one who curses you I will curse. And in you all the families of the earth shall be blessed. So Abram went as the Lord had told him, and Lot went with him. The word of the Lord. The psalm is Psalm 121. We'll read it responsively. I lift up my eyes to the hills. From where is my help to come? My help comes from the Lord, the maker of heaven and earth. The Lord will not let your foot be moved, nor will the one who watches over you fall asleep. Behold, the keeper of Israel will never slumber nor sleep. The Lord watches over you. The Lord is your shade at your right hand. The sun will not strike you by day, nor the moon by night. The Lord will preserve you from all evil and will keep your life. The Lord will watch over your going out and your coming in from this time forth forevermore. The second reading is from the book of Romans, in the fourth chapter, verses 1 through 5 and then 13 through 17. What then are we to say was gained by Abraham, our ancestor, according to the flesh? For if Abraham was justified by works, he has something to boast about, but not before God. For what does the scripture say? Abraham believed God, and it was reckoned to him as righteousness. Now to one who works, wages are not reckoned as a gift, but as something due. But to one who without works trusts him who justifies the ungodly, such faith is reckoned as righteousness. For the promise that he would inherit the world did not come to Abraham or to his descendants through the law, but through the righteousness of faith. If it is the adherents of the law who are to be the heirs, faith is null and the promise is void. For the law brings wrath, but where there is no law, neither is there violation. For this reason it depends on faith, in order that the promise may rest on grace and be guaranteed to all his descendants, not only to the adherents of the law, but also to those who share the faith of Abraham, for he is the father of us all. As it is written, I have made you the father of many nations. In the presence of the God in whom he believed, who gives life to the death and calls into existence the things that do not exist. The word of the Lord. According to John chapter 3. Lord, now there was a Pharisee named Nicodemus, a leader of the Jews. He came to Jesus by night and said to him, Rabbi, we know that you are a teacher who has come from God, for no one can do these signs that you do apart from the presence of God. Jesus answered him, Very truly I tell you, no one can see the kingdom of God without being born from above. Nicodemus said to him, How can anyone be born after having grown old? Can one enter the second time into the mother's womb and be born? Jesus answered, Very truly, I tell you, no one can enter the kingdom of God without being born of water and spirit. What is born of the flesh is flesh, and what is born of the spirit is spirit. Do not be astonished that I say to you, you must be born from above. The wind blows where it chooses, and you hear the sound of it, but you don't know where it comes from or where it goes. So it is with everyone who is born of the Spirit. Nicodemus said to him, How can these things be? Jesus answered him, 
Are you a teacher of Israel, and yet you do not understand these things? Very truly, I tell you, we speak of what we know and testify to what we have seen, yet you do not receive our testimony. If I have told you about earthly things and you do not believe, how can you believe if I tell you about heavenly things? No one has ascended into heaven except the one who descended from heaven, the Son of Man. And just as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whoever believes in him may have eternal life. For God so loved the world that he gave his only Son, so that everyone who believes in him may not perish, but have eternal life. Indeed, God did not send the Son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through him. The Gospel of the Lord. This one starts out a little dry, but I beg you, hang in there with me. The Second Ecumenical Council of the Vatican, otherwise known as Vatican II, consisted of four sessions between 1962 and 1965. There will be a test at the end of this sermon, so please pay attention. This council produced many documents and statements and decrees, including a three-year rotation of scripture readings. This gave birth to the revised Common Lectionary in 1992, which gives each of the main Gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, their own liturgical year, and gives John, most of the time, main church festivals such as Christmas and Easter. This three-year rotation of scripture readings was formulated to unite the Christian church around the globe, regardless of language or culture or denomination. So in other words, broadly speaking, if you worship at a Christian church in South America or Australia on a Sunday morning, you'll likely be hearing the same scripture readings that you would hear at Gloria Day Lutheran Church in Iowa City. So why do we care? That's the question. We're Lutherans after all. And no matter how progressive and open-minded we might be, we still tense at the thought that the Vatican might impact how we worship. But it does. The Revised Common Lectionary, born out of Vatican II and adopted by the Lutheran Church, dictates what is heard and preached during this three-year rotation of Scripture. So who made these selections? The answer to this will not surprise you. Present were the popes who convened and closed the council, as well as thousands of church fathers, each of whom was entitled to bring a theologian or other expert of his choice. Senior members of other Christian denominations, like the Lutheran Church, were invited to observe, as well as select sisters from the Roman Catholic Church. Neither of these last two categories were allowed to vote. Of course, I told you you would not be surprised. In doing so, by deciding which texts were to be included in this rotation and which were to be left out, the council took control of the popular narrative of the Bible. That is to say, which stories steer and shape how the Bible and God are popularly understood. The lectionary was shaped by the image of a victorious God and God's people on one hand, and conquered peoples and their gods on the other hand. Ones with power determine the popular narrative of history, religion, culture. When this happens, though, essential stuff gets left out. My eldest son recently took a class during his January term at Luther College called History and Memory. The class engaged the question, who gets to decide how history is recorded? It's the heroes, the victors, the conquerors who record history. Popular narrative is shaped by winners. As a result, we are subconsciously trained to look for heroes and villains, assigning races, colors, genders, and sexual orientations to each. In this way, according to this narrative, life is simple. Black villains and white heroes. But simple does not mean accurate. For example, 
Doug and I went to the Truthsgiving program sponsored by the Englert Theater last November. Peoples from five indigenous nations were present and they said, you know that story about pilgrims and Indians sitting down for a feast together to celebrate a bountiful harvest? Well, you know that's a story only white people tell to justify a manifest destiny. And while I was angry because this messes with my favorite holiday and its food, I knew it to be true. We tell that story to make ourselves feel better, even knowing it is a false narrative. Even though I adore turkey and pumpkin pie, I know deep down the popular narrative of a joint pilgrim and Indian potluck is an untruth. And you know it too. The popular biblical narrative highlights God's victorious arm and the people who do God's bidding in defeating, eliminating, or conquering both those who get in God's way as well as the godless heathen who are trampled underfoot. And this is even articulated in some beloved Christian hymns, such as Mine Eyes Have Seen the Glory, which is actually a battle song written for Union troops in the Civil War. Our reading today from Genesis is a great example of the popular biblical narrative's need to have a winner and a loser. In the few short verses from Genesis 12, 1 through 4, an awful lot happens. God calls Abram to get up and travel a great distance to the foreign land of Canaan. God promises to make of Abram a great nation, christened with infinite blessings, as well as protection from those who curse him. While a slightly longer reading from this passage, verses 1 through 9, appears later this year, the 20 verses of this entire story never, ever, ever show up in the three-year rotation of Scripture. Why? Because the Council of Cardinals and Bishops of Vatican II decided the whole story should not be included. Why? Because it's uncomfortable. Why? Because in the full story, Abram, to whom God establishes the eternal covenant to be the God of Abram's descendants, the children of Israel, passes off his wife Sarai as his sister in order to spare his own life, delivering her into the hands of Pharaoh to use as his plaything. And she never even gets to say a word. In fact, Sarai is not even named in today's scripture. She's mentioned by name only once in the slightly longer reading later this year, so we never get to hear the whole story in church, much less her side of it, which includes only her name, but never ever her voice, barely named, and without voice, she is dominated and conquered. Her body is traded as property, Strongly resonant with any of us of the hashtag Me Too generation, the sacrifice of her body and her role in fulfilling the promise God made to Abram are an afterthought. Her identity usually couched in what she lacks. She is barren. She is without child until God opens her womb, at which time she finally achieves full worth and value in her ancient patriarchal world. In fact, Sarai doesn't even speak a single word until four long chapters later when, in her desperation to conceive, she begs her slave Hagar to bear a child for her. When Hagar conceives, she resents Sarai, and when Sarai begs Abram for help, he tells her, you know, that's your problem, not mine. Sarai's popular narrative is told through the lens of patriarchs with power, making her little else than a necessary accessory to Abram and merely the means through which God's promises are fulfilled. In other words, while Abram gets the accolades of being faithful and righteous, even though he makes mistakes, Sarai is valued only when her uterus functions. Abram is the father of many nations, and Sarai, well, she's his trusty sidekick with working ovaries, a baby machine. According to the popular biblical narrative's necessity that there be a winner and a loser, Sarai is not the only one who gets the short end of the stick. 
God commands Abram to go to the land of Canaan, promising Abram that he will inhabit that land, which is already inhabited by Canaanites. This makes us North Americans squirm, at least it should, because we have also participated in a history of inhabiting a land that was already occupied. The Israelites' dream is about to become the Canaanites' nightmare, according to popular biblical narrative. The narrative emphasizes God's promise that, Canaanite, that Canaan's inhabitants will not only become slaves, but they will actually be totally destroyed. While historical scholars have shown that it is highly likely that the Israelites moved into Canaan and assimilated into their culture peaceably, the popular narrative needs a hero and a villain, a victor and a victim. And so certain verses are chosen, painting the gruesome picture of the blood of the slaughtered Canaanites soaking the ground as God looses God's terrible swift sword upon them. Here's where all of this is going. Must there be a winner and a loser, a conqueror and a victim, a hero and a villain? Must we cherry pick certain verses and stories to paint the image of God as war chief? The chosen and righteous receiving blessing and the rejected and trampled receiving damnation? Is this really what we profess? and confess as Christians? Some would say yes. In fact, those that say yes are shrill and noisy these days, spewing a false winner-takes-all theology and feeding into the popular narrative that God loves winners and hates losers, which is in fact diametrically opposed to who God is. Over and over again, God sides with the disenfranchised, the poor, the vulnerable. The toxic civil religion that claims that God is on the side only of white, wealthy, heterosexual, powerful people and opposed to other races, orientations, identities, ideologies, and religions is not only problematic, it's poisonous and decidedly unchristian. After all, if we're to be brutally honest, how can we condemn World War II Germany's Lebensraum or Putin's atrocious invasion of Ukraine without first acknowledging our own country's bloody manifest destiny, knowing that this church and all of our homes are built on stolen land? How can we claim to be one nation under God while failing to celebrate all people as children of a spectacularly diverse God. How can I demand my rights while stripping you of yours? In order for me to have rights, must you have none? Does my having a voice mean you have no voice? Does my presence mean that you are erased? Must my truth cancel yours? In order for me to fully live, must I kill you? Must it threaten church patriarchy to celebrate an equally strong matriarchy? Must it be so black and white? To insist on black and white finally is to embrace hypocrisy. These popular narratives thrive either because they are created by those who will do anything to keep their power or by those who will compromise anything to get power and cherry picking verses from the Bible only feeds into that. But in the end, God is the God of the powerless as well as the powerful. Because isn't the God of Abram also the God of Sarai and Hagar? Isn't the God of Israel also the God of Canaan? Isn't the God of David also the God of Goliath? Isn't the God of Moses also the God of Pharaoh? If not, then we are implying that there is another God. And yet we confess that there are not two gods but one. We confess that there is one God, creator of all people, all things seen and unseen. The question to ponder today is this.
In matters of faith, must there be winners and losers? Must life and all that it contains, politics and religion and relationships, must it all depend on heroes and villains? The world says yes, but the Christian must say no. The world demands black and white, but Christians live in the gray, where it's messy, where grace abounds. True, many Christians don't like that because it does not fit the victor's agenda to wipe the other out. But if we look at the entire biblical narrative and God's entire narrative, we discover that my existence does not depend on your obliteration. It is possible that Israel moves into the land of Canaan without full-scale war, it is possible that people fall in love and beliefs are shared and black and white blend and humanity thrives. We don't need to recast and redact biblical narrative to an either or theology. God does not need our protection. Isn't it possible that I can move into your world and your reality and you into mine without my needing to conquer you or you me? Is there not much to learn from and love about the other? These things need not threaten. In Jesus, all of these things are possible. Is Abram perfect? Because we know he's not. Does God love him because he makes all the right decisions at exactly the right times? Ridiculous. Does God love us because we make all the right decisions at exactly the right time? Absurd. Does God love the Canaanites less than the Israelites? Of course not. Does God love Goliath less than David? No. Or Pharaoh less than Moses? No. Of course not. This is the popular narrative pushing us into a winner-takes-all religion and a scarcity mindset that suggests God somehow doesn't have enough love or grace to go around. If faith depends on any of us following the letter of the law, then we all fail. That's the brutal honesty of it. In our gospel, Nicodemus comes to Jesus at night. They have a very honest conversation. I feel that's when I most often come to Jesus, truthfully, in my restless dreams or abrupt awakenings, thinking of people that I have failed or mistakes that I have made, harm that I have participated in, words and action that I regret. Omitting Abram's mistakes from our electionary rotation does not erase his sin. But despite his sin, he is righteous because God's mercy knows no bounds. Sinful humans are righteous simply because God declares it so. God is in loving relationship with us, even when we don't want to be in relationship with God. I'm a mom. I know what it's like to love a little child who's swinging at me, a child who I know would kill me if they had better control of their fine motor skills. I know what it means to love a child, not because they deserve it, but because they're mine. This is what grace is. This is God's narrative. There's great freedom in this. Once we've been liberated from the winner-takes-all popular biblical narrative that God loves and blesses me because of my skin color or good looks or heterosexuality or wealth, and you are less loved and less blessed because you are poor or gay or have brown skin or call God by another name. Once we reject this false narrative of Christianity, we find astonishing freedom in Christ, freedom for both winners and losers, for heroes and villains, freedom from oppression and freedom from oppressing freedom from being used as someone's plaything, and freedom from using others as my plaything, freedom from being conquered, and freedom from conquering others, freedom from being crushed, and freedom from crushing others. We cannot mistake human popular narrative for God's narrative. 
While we are tempted to grasp at random verses and incomplete stories that justify our hatred and bloodlust, while we sharpen our claws in order to destroy and dominate and conquer, God's whole story pulls us instead towards incomprehensible grace, where love from God and relationship with God are defined neither by perfection nor by the need to win, but simply by who God is. The God of Abram, the God of Sarai, the God of Israel, and the God of Canaan, the God of me, and the God of you, the God of all. Amen. Our next hymn is number 598. For by grace you have been saved. Please rise. together profess our faith using the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day he rose again. He ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father, and he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Sustained by God's abundant mercy, let us pray for the Church, the world, and all creation. O oh God, you so love your church. Raise up leaders who care for your people. Bless lay theologians, seminary and college professors, and all who are called to the ministry of teaching, that they form and inspire us for the work of the gospel. Merciful God, O oh God, you so love your creation. Breathe new life into our planetary home. Guide the work of researchers, scientists, and activists who love your earth and who inspire us to care for the natural world. Merciful God, O oh God, you so love the world, uphold leaders who resist tyranny and oppression, strengthen organizations that promote peace and harmony, direct their work to alleviate human suffering and to address its root causes. Merciful God, O oh God, you so love your people, 
draw near to all who live with mental illness, depression, or addiction, and accompany them in healing and recovery. Hear the cries of those who look to you in their distress. We pray for Althea, Desmond, Annie, Trevor, and Chris. We pray for the family and friends of Dean Heber. We pray for Vilda Sutherland and her family, grieving the death of her daughter, Martha. We pray for these others whose names and needs we each lift before you now. Merciful God, O oh God, you so love your children, bless the young in our midst, and delight us with their joy, wonder, and curiosity. Revive our ministries with children and youth, and equip us all for faithful discipleship. Merciful God, O oh God, you so love your saints, as our ancestors in the faith have been a blessing to us, so inspire us by their example of holy living to be a blessing to those who come after us. Merciful God, we lift our prayers to you, O God, trusting in your steadfast love and your promise to renew your whole creation through Jesus Christ, our Savior. Amen. Please be seated. pray. God of good gifts, receive these and all our offerings as we present them in faithful service for the sake of your gospel. Prepare our hearts to receive you in this meal as you pour out your very presence through Christ Jesus, the wellspring of eternal life. Amen. Amen. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. 
it is indeed right. Our duty and our joy that we should at all times and in all places give thanks and praise to you, almighty and merciful God, through our Savior, Jesus Christ. You call your people to cleanse their hearts and prepare with joy for the Paschal Feast that renewed in the gift of baptism, we may come to the fullness of your grace. And so with all the choirs of angels, with the church on earth and the hosts of heaven, we praise your name and join their unending hymn. which he was betrayed our Lord Jesus took bread and gave thanks he broke it and gave it to his disciples saying take and eat this is my body given for you do this for the remembrance of me and again after supper he took the cup gave thanks and gave it for all to drink saying this cup is the new covenant in my blood shed for you and for all people for the forgiveness of sin do this for the remembrance of me Gathered into one by the Holy Spirit, let us pray as Jesus taught. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trial and deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours now and forever. Amen. Come and receive Jesus, our strength in the wilderness. Thanks be to God. Please be seated. We begin with those of you who are communing with the prepackaged elements in your pews, and also those of you who are joining us at home. If you would take the, the bread at this time. The body of Christ given for you. The blood of Christ shed for you.
blood of Christ. Please stand. The body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ strengthen you and keep you in his grace. Amen. <clears throat> Embodied God at your table, we have tasted the goodness of Jesus. With the eyes of our hearts open to your promise, empower us to hear the needs of our neighbors and touch the world with your love. Amen. God, the giver of love, Christ, the resurrection and the life, and the Holy Spirit of new birth, bless you in this Lenten journey. Amen. Our sending hymn, number 796. <laughs>